It's undeniable the cost of living is going up. To buy a house is out of reach for a growing amount of Canadians. You can see Niagara Falls from here if you look really carefully between the trees. Lovely older brick bungalow. Even though it's an older home, it's already kind of open with your kitchen. Mm -hmm. You could have an office, office here yeah. or have your parents here yeah. and you know, you can have that part of the house. It's like a little, like little solarium. Oh. Yeah. Carol Frick Allen is a realtor in Font Hill, Ontario. She is showing me a house that just sold in this small, sleepy town in the Niagara region. It's quaint, so. but it's, it's cute. Yeah. And then we've got a full basement downstairs that's partly finished. What are you seeing in the market right now? Well, I think Niagara is a really interesting place to look at because we have an influx of people coming from out of town. Yeah. We've traditionally been a location where people love to retire to. Um, but our prices are really getting higher than what a lot of the locals are used to. So Carol, how have you seen maybe the price jump over the last couple of years right here in Font Hill? I think in the whole Niagara region yeah. too. Um, year over year, for instance, last year over this year, in our little town, 755 was average sale price last October. We're up to 950 wow. right now. Statistics Canada reports inflation is at an 18 year high. So we've all been feeling it. The price of gas, food, heating has all gone up. In October, the average price for gas in the Ontario area was 1.46 cents a litre. Last year this time, 98.4 cents a litre to fill up your tank. And Patrick DeHaan from Gas Buddy says this is the new normal. I think for most of the winter, prices will remain near or at today's levels. So Patrick, will we see this trickle down to home heating as winter approaches? Fuel bills this winter could be 75% higher than last year, uh, or even potentially double what they were last year in some areas across Canada. And the price of food has also skyrocketed. In the last six months, meat has gone up 52%, and fruits cost 9% more across the country. Canada Food Price Report says the average family will spend almost $700 more on groceries compared to last year. Janet Music is one of the researchers in that report. Hi Janet. So I just bought $21.87 worth of food. So I got some salad. Um, I got some chicken thinking I could make kind of a chicken salad. And I got some, oh, and the chicken was $13.84. And I got some clementines as a little dessert. So that came up, as I said, $21.87. Why has the price of food gone up so much? Well, there are a number of reasons that food costs are rising. And, you know, one of those is COVID-19, of course. Um, you know, things were locked down and, and there were a lot of labor shortages in, in Canada, but across the world. The other big factor in rising prices is climate change. And so... You know, this, this year was really difficult in the growing season and not just for plants, but for, for cattle farmers, for hog farmers. And with COVID-19 pandemic emergency benefits running out, people are left destitute. Natalie Appleyard is a socioeconomic policy analyst at Citizens for Public Justice, who recently released a report on poverty trends. Well, we heard from many people that when they received CERB, it was one of the first times in their life that they can remember not having to stress about paying the rent or putting food on the table. And the fact that this benefit is now coming to an end with no adequate replacement um, is, is a huge problem. And while Canada offers different social assistance programs, many people fall through the cracks. The Canada Child Benefit, which is often talked about by government officials as one of their go-to poverty reduction strategies, is tied to people's immigration and citizenship status. We also know that for single working age adults that many of the benefits don't include them. We also know that people with disabilities and people on social assistance, their benefits are inadequate. Whether you look at any province or territory across the country, no social assistance, no disability assistance is actually adequate to bring people above the poverty lines. And without a proper approach, people will continue to suffer. Who are the most affected by inflation and lack of affordability? This week on Context, holding on to hope for people living on the edge of poverty.
I've arrived at the Daily Bread Food Bank in Toronto to get a clearer picture of the needs of people living in Canada's largest city. Neil Hetherington is the CEO of the Daily Bread Food Bank in Toronto. Every day they deliver 60,000 pounds of food to food banks across the city. So a uh, massive increase in food bank usage. Um, so that has gone from about 55, 60,000 people in Toronto up to 125,000 uh, visits per month. Uh, something that we never thought was possible, obviously a historic uh, record of people that um, just can't make ends meet and it isn't getting better. Talk to me about the change in clientele that you've seen over the years, you know, back maybe 10 years ago compared to today. That's where, you know, I do have hope. We have seen some positive things. When, uh, when the federal government brought in the GIS for seniors, yeah. we did see a uh, decline in the number of seniors who had to make use of food banks, which was uh, positive. We're seeing more and more working age individuals who are having to make use of food banks. So that is disheartening. Younger people who are having to make use of uh, food banks, students. Um, so it's everybody, I, w I would say. You know, we can, we can talk about you know, the higher percentage of individuals who are from the BIPOC community um, who are having to make use of it disproportionate to, uh, to their population. Um, and so we talk about systemic issues uh, that are affecting these different types of groups and say, how can we do something positive? And the irony of all of this is as we see food costs go up, food prices go up, food increased prices also affect you here at the food bank. They sure do. So on, t on two fronts. One is, so there is a 7% escalation in food prices this year. So that hurts the people that need to, uh, to purchase food. So our lineups increase. So our demand increases. At the same time, our prices to buy food and fill up this warehouse has increased by that same percentage. So it makes it more difficult for us to be able to serve uh, the community. We hear the word crisis a lot being used when it comes to affordable housing, uh, food insecurity, all of these things. But I'm always uh, motivated by you, Neil, because every time we come and chat with you, you use the word hope, the, the H word. Why do you hold on to that hope? The reason I have hope is because we, we fundamentally know what needs to be fixed. Mm. We want our values to be lived out and we just need that political motivation, uh, that leadership to be able to, uh, to say how do we enact that so that there is no Canadian who has to make use of a food bank. But the reality is that more and more Canadians are experiencing food insecurity. Even before the pandemic, one in eight Canadian households struggled to put food on the table. And for single mothers, that stat goes up to one in four. In August alone, there was over 113,000 visits to Daily Bread member food banks. That's up 67% from last year. And yet food banks can't do it all. I'm going to take you to one church that's reaching out to low-income families in rural towns in Ontario. Let's go. Thanks, Nate, for having us here today. We're in your kitchen of your church. Tell us what happens here and how you're able to use this space to reach out to your community. Yeah, thanks for coming, Maggie. Yeah. Um, well, this has been something for us where we've just found that uh, a lot of folks in our, in our community who are experiencing the challenges of affordability these days, mm. where uh, they, there's, there becomes this a bit of a dichotomy. It's oversimplified, but in some ways it's a, can I afford my housing or can I afford my food? Mm which is not a fair choice for people to have to make. And so for our community, there's been an opportunity where uh, everybody in our church community is, is leaning into saying, well, let's start by uh, eating together and cooking together and helping to provide some more food security as a starting place and hopefully build relationship around that. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it starts right here in the kitchen where so the opportunity has been not only to cook meals and then bring them out into a common space together and eat together in a, in, as a group, which is great and we love that, but also to be able to say, well, what does that look like the rest of the week when we're not eating together? And for our community to come in here, and there's just a lot of wonderful volunteers and guests who participate together in coming in to cook together, mm -hmm. to say, well, what does it look like? Let's say, when we pool our resources and we all bring in, chip in you know, a few dollars, we can really do a lot together. We can cook on a larger scale and we can take a lot of food home in a way that's really sustainable, mm -hmm. hopefully cooking in healthy ways, relationally being together and just coming away with, with food and actually being able to afford it. We're in Welland, Ontario. That's right. So, you know, I, you know, we think about, when we think about affordable housing, when we think about the need, we kind of focus on Toronto, we focus on the city centers, 
but we're in rural Ontario where you are seeing need. Tell me about this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in some ways it's, it's a bit analogous to, to, to waves and some of the waves that come out from Toronto in regards to rising prices that, that start in Toronto and in other places as well. I mean, it's not picking on Toronto yeah, in this yeah. in any way, but what we're all experiencing is as people kind of need to move away from where it's most expensive, there's a ripple effect where people are moving out towards Hamilton and from Hamilton towards the Niagara region. And here on the, on the far side of the Niagara region, you see a lot of the, the waves breaking here, where for a lot of uh, folks, they're just, there's, there's no longer enough housing here. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough housing at all. And for folks who have been pretty close to experiencing homelessness or just on the verge of being able to afford their housing, it's becoming unmanageable. And for a lot of folks, it's been unmanageable for quite a while. Southridge is about to resume their collective kitchen program after almost a year of being closed. And they already have a long lineup of people waiting to get in. Next, the lack of affordable housing. Some have called it a crisis. We speak to one organization that says they have a hopeful solution. We are an undeniable voice, but we are not political. We are media missionaries. Indwell has been providing affordable housing in one way or the other over the past 50 years, like this building behind me. Well, today we're going to meet with Graham Cubitt, who's going to show us a new build they're working on. Ready to go. In the heart of the city. So, Graham, thanks for having us here today. Yeah, thanks for being here. Tell us where we are. So, we're at Royal Oak Dairy on East Avenue in Hamilton. Um, it's an old industrial brownfield site, uh, former dairy that was converting into affordable housing. Wow. How many units will be here once this is all set and done? The total site will be 139 apartments, ranging from studio apartments right through three bedroom apartments. Wow. And so families, singles, people will be living here. This will be a new community. Tell me about the list of people waiting to get into this building, these buildings. So the, the list is long, unfortunately, in Hamilton. There's over 6,000 households who are looking for affordable housing. Um, the number who have called Indwell directly is over 2,000 people. Hamilton is one example of many cities across our country that are seeing an affordable housing shortage. There's mm -hmm. definitely housing out there. Some have called it a crisis. Do you see this as a crisis? It's a real crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. We have, uh, as I say, literally thousands of people who have called us. Uh, in our London community, over 500 people called us last year looking for housing. Oh. And we only have 67 apartments. The rapid, very quick price appreciation in the real estate market has meant that a lot of buildings that were rental apartments or you know, maybe a duplex or triplex have turned into either more expensive units or have been turned back into single family homes. So that's a loss to the housing stock. Um, but also, you know, the pandemic has really made a dramatic change in where people are living and working from. And, and so we've seen across Ontario actually homelessness emerge um, as a real problem in rural communities as well as larger urban communities. Paint a picture of the person that is in need of affordable housing right now. Once upon a time it was, you know, we would think of homeless people that are living on the streets, but now we're looking at people who have an income coming in and yet they can't afford housing. The reality is that in Hamilton for many years you could you know, affordable housing was, was primarily an issue for people who might be receiving Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Support Program, ODSP. Um, but if you had, you know, $450 for rent, you could, you need $100 to get to the 550 or 650 was a common rent for a one bedroom. Now, one bedroom apartments are well over $1,200. And that's more than the whole ODSP uh, check for a month. So. Now it's much broader than that though. If you're working full time, even $20 an hour, it's hard to afford an apartment at $1,500 or $1,600, which is a common rent for a one bedroom now. It's, it's really an issue of uh, very, very fast price appreciation in rent and wages, salaries haven't kept up. And so we see a lot of tenants when they get stable housing, uh, other complexities like maybe addiction or mental health issues can be addressed. Uh, people finish school, people, one of our tenants just got her PhD. Uh, people get back in touch with family and they rebuild social connections with, uh, with friends. 
a lot of people go back to work. Uh, almost 100% of our tenants when they move in are not working. Uh, we recently did a study about 25% of our tenants are back to work uh, or, or back in school. So it's a tremendous uh, shift in people's uh, thinking about themselves and their perception of what's possible in the world and indeed uh, the community's perception of, of those who live with mental health or addiction or other complexities. It is wonderful to be able to live here. Janice Cameron is one of Indwell's more than 700 tenants. It is, um, it's security. Um, you feel like you can breathe and like you can actually not have to be afraid of whether you're going to have a place to live. It sounds like you're describing home. Yes. Janice came to Indwell after a series of unfortunate events that could happen to anyone. Left with a limited income and no place to live, the wait lists for affordable housing were more than 10 years long. So I had been working and I have a physical disability and my condition had worsened which meant that I could no longer afford my rent, which at the time was about $900 a month. So I um, began looking and trying to apply for subsidized housing while switching from a two bedroom apartment to a bachelor apartment. Um, unfortunately, the building that I moved into had a major infestation of both cockroaches and bed bugs. And so within about 10 weeks, um, they started into my apartment and I, um, the infestation was so bad that it meant I was going to need to throw all of my belongings out. At that point, before I moved to The Bachelor, I was already looking for the lowest cost places that I could possibly um, afford. She eventually found a small apartment to share with someone else, but when that fell through, she found herself homeless living in a shelter. And the waiting list for Indwell at that time was three to five years, but the waiting list on subsidized housing was 10 to 13 years long. And so it just felt hopeless in terms of, well, okay, like I'm desperate and things aren't okay right now. And I don't have people that I can couch surf in terms of staying in their, on their couches while trying to wait for 10 years to go by. Like, what am I going to do? Jana says she fell into depression as she desperately looked for a way out. Eventually, I considered whether or not to try to break the law so that I'd get thrown into jail, thinking, well, okay, I don't know whether there's a different avenue if you've been in jail, but at this point, I don't know where I'm, I'm going to be, and I was terrified to be living on the street. While at the shelter, a door opened for her to live at one of Indwell's buildings in Hamilton. She has now called Indwell home for the past three years. Where do you think you'd be if you didn't get that call from Indwell that day? I don't know if I would be alive if I didn't get, get that help. Why do you say that? I was really, really depressed when, when things are really bad and you don't have some place to live. Um, you have to make choices between whether you're going to have food or whether you're going to have a roof, but you know that you don't have enough money to deal with clothing as, as well as food, as, as well as rent. And if you have special medications like I did, sometimes you have to pay for those as well. And all of that can add up and it's not something that you can juggle. Yeah. So um, it's very easy when you're looking, when, when, you, when you're in a crisis, it's very hard to be told that we can't help you until 10 years. And so depression gets really bad and things feel pretty, pretty hopeless. So yeah, I d don't really think I would be alive if it wasn't for Indwell. And there are so many other stories like Janice's across our country. Unfortunately, not all of them end in safe, affordable housing like Indwell. Some estimates are that over 283,000 households are waiting for affordable housing right now in Canada.
back at the site of Indwell's current project in Hamilton, Graham explains why faith and hope are a huge part of the puzzle when it comes to housing. First of all, we don't get pushed back because we're a Christian organization. In fact, people appreciate that our values drive uh, what we do, love for our neighbor, mm -hmm. that we, we affirm the inherent dignity of all people, uh, and that we hold on to hope. Mm -hmm. Hopefulness is not part of the narrative in affordable housing these days, and so when people are without hope, they're getting frustrated, they're getting upset or angry, um, saying there is hopeful solutions, there are hopeful solutions, um, is a really important message. So the need is great. There is a lack of affordable housing, there's food insecurity, not to mention the increase in prices of gas, clothing and internet. And while Indwell and Southridge are two examples of the church doing something within their communities, the church needs to do more. We're going to discuss with the Q panel next. In our fast-paced world, context is everything to the stories that are shaping us. We want to go beyond the headlines in our new podcast to create space for meaningful conversations, to explore where faith intersects with justice, ethics, culture, and society. We'll be joined by newsmakers, peacemakers, and culture shapers. Join us on all podcast platforms or at contextbeyondtheheadlines.com. So the Q panel is back. We're upstairs here at the Crossroads Center. Julia and Colin are joining me today. Calvin is away. Julia, I'm going to start with you. We've heard about the realities of Canadians struggling to get by. The issue can seem too big to solve, especially as the cost of living is only going up. It's becoming easier and easier for people to slip below the poverty line. What are your observations at the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada? Hmm. Well, I think that when economies worsen and inflation increases, it's always those who are poor and marginalized who are the hardest hit. I mean, we are all feeling it with every trip to the grocery store or the gas pumps when our household bills arrive each month. But those who live closest to the margins feel these shifts the most and are least able to weather them. You know, every situation is unique, every life, every family, and there are always exceptions. But it is a persistent reality in Canada that it tends to be the same groups of people who are more likely to experience poverty, food insecurity or housing insecurity than others. So people who are indigenous, who are black, people of color living with disability, who are single or unattached or LGBTQ plus are most likely to experience poverty in Canada. And I think it's important that we do the work of asking why that is and how do we address those factors and inequalities that were built into our systems and structures a long time ago that caused those realities to persist in spite of all the efforts and progress we have made. So poverty disproportionately impacts certain groups because of underlying inequalities in our society. And these trends have only been made worse by the pandemic. So when I think about our church communities, um, I think it's important that we listen and learn and that we resist the temptation to think that poverty is mainly the result of bad luck or bad decisions. We can resist, and we used to hear this often when we did work on poverty and homelessness very intentionally, that pull yourself up by your bootstraps way of thinking. I mean, yes, sometimes hard work and perseverance and persistence pay off. And we all appreciate, you know, good work ethic and commitment and all that good stuff. But it's hard to pull your bootstraps up when you don't have any boots, either because you and your ancestors had your boots stolen or maybe you never had boots in the first place. So if it were just about those things, bad luck, bad decisions, lack of motivation, we would expect to see similar rates and experiences of poverty across the population, but we don't. We're not, on a, we're not all on equal footing. And so we need to understand and acknowledge that and work to change it. So well said, Julia. There are so many nuances when it comes to this issue and so many people living paycheck to paycheck and just a paycheck away from uh, things only getting worse. Colin, I want to go to you next. I'm going to run a clip from Graham Cubitt from Indwell. Um, and, and he's saying some interesting things about what he's seeing the churches do and, and the response churches are having when it comes to affordable housing. Take a look at this. The interesting thing is that we've actually started to see, and particularly in rural communities, um, churches are leaning into this problem in an interesting way. The pandemic has changed 
uh, maybe how congregations are worshiping or the regularity with which they use their building uh, or their property, and they're starting to say the needs around us, this housing issue seems to be a major problem. What would it look like if we repurposed our building for affordable housing? You know, how could that have an impact on our community? So there seems to be some positive momentum in that direction to find long-term solutions. So he's essentially saying that churches are calling Indwell, calling him personally and saying, yeah, we're not using our buildings that much anymore. How could we use them for community? How can we open our doors? How can we use this to solve this issue of affordable housing? What are your thoughts on this, on how the church can address poverty? Yeah, I think that this is an example of one of various ways that Christians can move beyond some of our traditional thinking about these questions. We've been often caught up in issues of, say, charity. How can we give to those who are experiencing poverty? Instead of thinking about systemic issues that we could help to prevent or we could help to alleviate. Um, and this also goes along with uh, maybe rethinking a little bit our role in society not thinking of ourselves as separate from society, just trying to draw people into a church so that they can, you know, someday be in heaven with Jesus, but thinking of ourselves as ambassadors of Christ in the here and now, who are helping to bring the kingdom of God uh, into fruition in the here and now in some meaningful sense, not in its full sense, wow. but in some meaningful sense. So those churches that are doing that work, they're doing a form of gospel work mm -hmm. by creating uh, helpful structures that are going to alleviate human suffering in the here and now and bring human flourishing. Every time a human flourishes, we see the kingdom of God a little bit more uh, beautifully, a little bit more fully, a little bit more truly in the here and now. The issue of poverty and the increase in cost of living is affecting us all. And while some of us could cut back and maybe stop driving as much, there is a significant part of our population that is being impacted and falling through the cracks. Indwell, Southridge, and the Daily Bread Food Bank, all organizations started by Christians are trying to make a difference in their communities, trying to stop people from falling through those cracks. But what if the cracks were repaired? What if the generational effects of poverty was stopped? Well, the hopeful part of this is that there are organizations standing on the front lines trying to make a difference. Thanks for watching Context. Let us know what you think of today's topic. Join the conversation on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For all of us here, I'm Maggie John. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a supporter-funded nonprofit organization and member of the Canadian Centre for Christian Charities. Thanks to faithful people like you, we are able to continue producing context. You can write to Crossroads, PO Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2, or visit crossroads.ca to learn more about our programs. Context Beyond the Headlines invites you to an exciting new season. This year, we're expanding our reach with a brand new podcast that will explore the interaction between faith, justice, culture, ethics, and society. As we move forward with this brand new season and the launch of this brand new podcast, would you consider partnering with Context financially? It is because of the generosity of viewers like you that we're able to continue to tell the stories that matter.